Okay, now we're, uh, we're going to take a little deeper look into why certain places, a particular place, in the value of R is critical to a bifurcation, the first bifurcation. And that's R equal 3. So let's take a look at what happens. So here's our logistics curve for R equal 2.5. And we already know from prior discussion that if we anywhere we start here, the system will migrate to this point of intersection between the logistics map and the this reference line we've been using. So for r less than three, the two and a half is less than three, the trajectory leads to this point right where they intersect. Let's look more closely at this. Imagine we zoomed in on this. You can see that this angle is larger than 90 degrees at the point of intersection. You can kind of see it here. It's easier to see here. So that's a key point greater than 90 degrees. Now let's raise the value of R to 3.6. And we know this would produce multiple results. We actually would have a trajectory that goes into orbit here, produces multiple values. What is the cur what does that angle look like here? Well, it's less than 90 degrees. And you can see, I just sketched this in in green to illustrate what happens here. If you start here, you hit the red curve over to blue, down to red, over to blue, and you'll get, this happens to be a case where you get four values. So something happens when we go from an angle bigger than 90 to an angle less than 90 right here. And what is that that happens? So, and for our, we've already said for r greater than three, it's hard to know how the trajectory is going to unfold. So why is three critical? So it turns out, and we're going to work through this, that the slope of the logistic curve at the intersection with the straight line is critical to determine how the trajectory progresses. And why is that so? So let's uh, we already had calculated the slope of the logistics curve everywhere is equal to r minus 2rx. And what we will now look at is what is the property of that slope? What is the property of the system when the slope is minus one? That is, when the trajectory, when this curved line has a slope of minus one, which is defined by this, what do we have? So we have this. this is an equation that relates the place where the slope is minus one and the value of r. And r appears twice here. Also, it's critical, we already know, that we relate this situation to the point where the straight line and the logistics curve intersect. And so now we have two equations. We have, this is the relationship between the line and the curve as a function of position. And we have a requirement that the slope be minus one, where that's what we're exploring. And we have two equations and two unknowns. The unknowns are x and r. So we can do some arithmetic. You should be able to do it <clears throat> if you've got a little bit of algebra in your, under your belt. And you find that this situation, where the slope of the red curve is minus one and intersects the straight line, where those points are the same, we find that x equals 2 thirds and r equals 3. And indeed, we, now, we know from doing numerical experiments in prior slides that when r is equal to 3, we, we have a bifurcation. And notice this, too. If you look at these numbers, you can see no bifurcation here, but the intersection point is not at x equals 2 thirds. It's at x equals about 0.6 here. And here we do have bifurcation, and the intersection point is somewhere just bigger than, slightly bigger than 0.72. And in fact, if you did numerical ex experiments here, you'd find that actually 
the exact point where this all happens is when x equals 2 thirds, which is, well, it's not on either one of these graphs. And that's the point where the two curves, the red curve and the blue curve, are perpendicular. That's the critical point that determines where that first bifurcation occurs. Those of you who want to study this problem in more detail will see this type of calculation done for the next bifurcation, where you go from two values to four values. You do a similar kind of analysis, except you will not be using the slope of the curve. You'll be doing the slope of the slope of the curve. And so the math gets a little more complicated as you try to find the values for bifurcation as a function of the R value. Now we're not going to do that in this lecture. So this tells us that R equal 3 is a special case, and we're going to explore that as we go on. OK, so now what we're going to do is calculate the boundaries in x, column x1 and x2. These are the populations, the lower population x1, the larger population x2, when we do have a bifurcation. And here's what I just illustrated in the prior page. The, this angle of intersection here is almost a right angle because we're at r equal 3.2. So let's do this. So when r is big enough, we get an orbit of two values. We've, we've started at some point, and we're just going around and around, as I illustrated in several cases earlier. So I'm going to show you the equations that dictate how we get these two values, this value x1 and this value x2. So, so the function that is, or the value that results from starting at x1, here's x1, we put that in our logistics equation, we get a new value, x2, right? That's what this says. We, we started here, and we get a result, and it's that point on the blue curve. And the new result that, that we're going to get takes this value, and plugs it into the logistics function again. So here we have the logistics function. We're going to apply it twice. Here's 1 minus x2 times x2 times r. Remember how the logistics function is laid out. Here it is. 1 minus the value times the value times r. Well, the new value is this whole thing. There it is. 1 minus that represents this part. And this thing is this business here, which is this whole thing again, times r. That's our next value. So if you work this out, if you multiply all this algebra out, we find that x1 equals r squared. There's the r and the r. And there's a an x value and a 1 minus x, that's this, and this business here turns into this. And we can see if you rearrange things a little bit, this is a cubic equation, right? Because this is a binomial, I mean, a, a polynomial of order 2, and then we have another thing here of order 1. So this has order 3 as a cubic equation. And, uh, you know, there are methods for solving cubic equations. They're fairly complicated. But if we go to our spreadsheet and put in r equals 3.2 and start at some random point, namely 0.1, and run the thing for about 10,000 times, which is what it's illustrated here, you find that the values that you get oscillate between two values, a smaller and larger value. The smaller value is 0 0.51304, and the larger is 0 0.79946. And then it goes back to the smaller, and then the bigger, and the smaller, and the bigger. So this is, this numerically represents what happens when we're just, the input and the output just get us into this loop around this intersection point. And at this point, we have nearly a right angle. 
between these two lines. So here's a little more detail for r equals 3.2. And here's the point that's in the middle, 0.6875. That's if you follow this point down carefully, you get 0.6875. So it's cubic in R, and uh, the next bifurcation, if you want to find the next one, it's the next higher power in R. I don't know if it's fourth or fifth, but the arithmetic gets very complicated. It's, it's generally much easier to use a spreadsheet like we've done here. So here's the trajectory for period four. Now we have an R value that takes us higher. We start here. We go up, over, down, over, up, over, down, over. And now you can see we're going to repeat because the next value is right back where we started at the first x value. Complicated, higher order solutions, so numerical methods are necessary. So let's go through it again. No matter where you start x, you're going to you put it in this equation and you're going to get this value, then that is going to be the new starting point. And then, then that one goes into the equation and we go do it again and we just keep doing this. So the end result as we work through it is a nested group of functions all starting with x1. Finding these exact points is, as I say, complicated it's easier to do it numerically. Uh, here I say it's a fifth order polynomial. So now something interesting here has to the, the question comes up always. Does the starting point matter? So here's our, our bifurcation diagram. Now this happens to be for r equals 3.5 and this one was for 3.5 as well. So I've started here, all the R's here are the same. Each column represents an experiment for a, a value of R. The starting point is different in each case though. In one case I started with at point one, which is way over here. The next one I started at point two, which is here. And the next I started in the middle, point five, which is the one I've drawn. And then we let the experiment run 10,000 times. And we find we oscillate between two values, point five, and 0.82694. And point eight, and you see it didn't matter. We started with point one here, we got these two values. Actually, we get we get four values. I apologize. We get four values: 82, 50, 87, and 38. If we started at point two, we get the same four values: 82, 50, 87, and 38. And notice these are these two are the same, these two are the same, and the same, and the same, but I've color-coded them because I want to illustrate that if you start at point 5, you still get the same four values. There's 82, 0.5, 87, and 38, except they don't occur in the same order. Nonetheless, the system oscillates between four values in every experiment. It's just a matter of how you get there. So let's talk about something students might want to consider building. This is called a Chua circuit. I'll show it to you in a second. Chua is a person who invented a very clever uh, electronic circuit that illustrates chaos. Uh, you can find uh, Chua speaking about this. He's a very smart guy. There's a link to a YouTube of him speaking about the Chua circuit and his work on on this topic, or you can go to Caltech has a discussion of Chua circuits. And what the Chua circuit does, I might as well show it to you at this point. There it is, not very complex. It produces a, a tone that you can hear if you hook a microscope, a microphone, or sorry, a speaker or a headset to this. You hear a signal in your in the acoustic spectrum, and it's just a pure tone that persists, and then all of a sudden it gets chaotic and you hear all kinds of crazy frequencies. So let's review. It has some inductors and resistors, a variable resistor here, a variable capacitor here, 
Uh, the only uh, complicated circuit is this operational amplifier. These are very inexpensive, probably about $2. So anybody can, with a few pennies to spare, can, oh, and you're going to need a couple of diodes and a battery. And then by tuning this resistor and this capacitor, you can change the operating frequency, but it always becomes chaotic, which is an interesting result. So uh, all the way so far, we've been talking about the logistics diagram Let's now look at some other bifurcation diagrams. They all have the property that they have a peak in the middle. I already, I already discussed earlier that um, uh, biological systems don't necessarily conform to a logistics diagram. It's a nice simplification. But look at this one. This is a, has a triangle shape. And it has this bifurcation diagram. Uh, this one has this property x e to the x, and it has this bifurcation diagram. I mean, you can see some similarities with, with the logistics function bifurcation diagram, but clearly some differences. Here's one x squared times 2 minus x squared. There's, there are branches. You can see these two branches bifurcation. Here's yet another one. Uh, here's x times 1 minus x squared, and so forth. But you see they all have a peak in the middle. This one's very similar, x times 1 minus x. has a bifurcation diagram that looks like this. And these are lead us to a very interesting result. This brings up uh, Feigenbaum I mentioned earlier. So if we plot some samples from that, that taxonomy of, of functions that behave like the logistics function, you find this. So here's some parameter that controls the shape of the curve. <clears throat> here's the, the L represents the logistics diagram. So hidden here is the logistics function. We've seen that many times. Here's the one for the sine function. If you take the trigonometric function sine and limit it from 0 to pi, you get this. Very similar, but it's shifted in depending on the maximum amplitude. It's shifted relative to logistics. And here's the triangle function, which does look a bit weird. Now, here's what Feigenbaum found. It's really remarkable. Here's the logistics function. And imagine that we put this vertical line right where the first bifurcation, <coughs> bifurcation occurs for r equal 3. There's, there it is, r equals 3. The next bifurcation at 3.45, we put that there. There it is. Uh, or is it? Yes. And we have the next one, next bifurcation, that gets us eight results, 16, 32. So, and you see these lines get compacted closer and closer together. And what we are doing here is using something that Feigenbaum came up with. He says, take a value of the bifurcation point and subtract its neighbor. So let's say we pick this one. Subtract the value of this one and then divide by this one minus this one. They have to play a little bit. I've put the numbers here so you can play a little bit and you'll eventually see. For the logistics function, if you do this calculation and just keep going as you go to higher and higher numbers of bifurcations, the this result, which is called delta, becomes at least 4.668, and it keeps changing. And ultimately, for the logistics function, it becomes 4.669 and a bunch of other digits. Now, here's the extraordinary thing. If we take the sine function, let's look at the prior. Here's the sine function. It has a different logistics function, uh, sorry, a different bifurcation diagram, and do the same experiment, the bifurcations occur at different places, not at 3, but they're at 0.71, and not at 3.54, but at 0.858. And if we work through this equation again, we get this number, and if you keep going, you get this number again.
nobody knows why all the curves that are illustrated here and here and any that have been tried all have this characteristic number if you compute this sorry this business here uh, this is called uh, frequently people will say this number is the equivalent of pi for chaotic systems because it's the same for all systems and as far as I know, nobody knows why or how, why its significance has not been revealed to us. So now we're entering part three. We have this cartoon. So I already mentioned uh, the idea that a butterfly flapping its wings might cause a hurricane thousands of miles away. And this, this came, I think, from the New Yorker. So let's stop here and we'll uh, reload another video.